Um, yeah, I think as the years develop, the similarities between simulation and real racing is getting closer and closer. Um, the accuracies are right there. The feeling you get as a driver is, are extremely close. Teams are using it as setup tools, uh, driver development tools, so that when they're actually going to the racetrack, they're as prepared as possible and learning as much as they are at the racetrack as they are away from the racetrack using a SimCraft simulator. So even over time, the past couple of years, things have developed extremely fast. So I think in the next few years, you're gonna see it keep developing. Um, people are gonna be learning more and more. I think drivers are gonna be developing even faster. Uh, the crazy thing is that, you know, I'm 29 now, I'm definitely getting older and you see guys that are, you know, 14 or 15 on simulators that are, you know, way faster than a lot of professionals. And it's interesting to see them go from simulation to real racing and how fast they're able to make that transition these days. I think back when I was growing up, you'd drive on your simulator, which was, you know, stationary, no moving, no moving parts. And you'd go to drive a real race car. The development when you got in the race car was such a huge learning curve. But I think these days kids can develop so fast on simulation that when they jump in a real race car, they're used to those sensations that they've felt on a SimCraft with the motion, the brake pedal, the steering force. And when they get in the race car, they're pretty much ready to go. I'm James Michael Osborne. Uh, I'm a physician, uh, surgeon in orthopedic spine surgery. I've got a master's degree in public health and a degree in economics. I am the founder of the Austin Hatcher Foundation for Pediatric Cancer, along with my wife, Amy Jo. And I'm a one-time race car driver in the Speed World Challenge Series. Good afternoon, my name is Scott Ackerman. I'm the president and co-founder of a company called CoreSight, uh, where we're creating physiological biometric patches for athletes in extreme environments. Uh, we've been working with Wayne Taylor Racing since uh, late 2016. Uh, we've been working with them each year as part of Wayne Taylor Racing's driver science program. Uh, we're now in our fifth year of physiological monitoring of our driver athletes uh, as part of the Wayne Taylor Racing program and we're here, we're here at Daytona for the 24-hour endurance race. So part of um, improving the executive function for children with cancer uh, and children in general, we developed a program with SimCraft and with CoreSyn uh, to work through this process in a safe environment and create a fun and engaging therapy to go with it. Saying that, this, the, the research protocol was developed along with the University of Tennessee, Johns Hopkins, uh, Washington National Children's Hospital, and Pittsburgh Children's Hospital, where our research coordinators are um, faculty. And this program was really designed around putting the children on the simulator, running them through a series of progressingly difficult driving scenarios, uh, and then doing sample testing along the way to evaluate the improvement that they get in their executive functions. So this is a project that uh, really came about as a result of, of a sponsorship and a, a collaboration with SimCraft in, in helping us with the um, these simulators, uh, as well as uh, with the race car drivers who helped us design an escalatingly difficult uh, driving scenario that allowed them to progress through uh, more difficult scenarios that will help activate the children's brains more. One of the inherent challenges with race car drivers is being able to train in an actual race car environment. Because of the costs associated with training, uh, getting a race team to attract fuel, tires, uh, crew, as well as the driver, it's extremely costly. The next best thing for a driver athlete is, to, is, is going to be able to train in a simulated environment. In my opinion, the absolute best opportunity for them to train is to try to simulate both the physical demands or physiological demands and cognitive demands. From a physiological standpoint, you're talking about heat, humidity, and other, which can be repli replicated in a simulated environment. Uh, in terms of cognitive demands, many driver athletes will tell you about the specific demands, G-force loading, axis of movement, deceleration, acceleration, lateral forces, and in that environment, if you can create those different planes of movement, 
you're going to be far better off in being able to prepare or acclimatize that driver athlete to a racing environment. SimCraft has created this uh, simulator where the tracks are, are, are true to form, true to track. Uh, if you talk to uh, and, and you listen to some of the interviews uh, of drivers that are racing in the uh, IMSA series, you can hear from them firsthand how valuable this type of training is towards their, uh, towards their, uh, their careers. We're talking about the closer it is to reality, the quicker your response time and the more accurate the response you're going to get. So understanding that um, a screen and you sitting in a lounge chair with a steering wheel is not going to result in that same response. Yes, you could practice it, you can see it, but it's not going to give you the whole body response. And that is what the executive function and the neuromodulation talks about is recreating the stimulus and the output so that the brain can uh, practice the pathway to result in the response you want. If the response that you're practicing on is different than the response that you're going to get in the race car, then that's not going to be inaccurate and it's it's not just creating a negative environment in that your body's going to expect one thing and it's going to see another. Uh, you're, you're much better off to line those up more closely so that you can have the input to your mind automatically re result in an output through your hands and feet so that those marry up more quickly and provide the right response. Again, you know, in driving on the street, we lift often when we go off the road. The right action is to steer with it and stay in the gas. You've got to have a way of practicing that in a safe environment so your mind gets used to that. I would say one of the most important functions or features of a simulated environment is to be able to provide driver feedback, physiological feedback, cognitive feedback in various planes of move motion. I know with SimCraft, they, they can work at six different planes of movement. Uh, I think the feedback that the, the driver receives from the actual simulator itself, as well as the feedback that the driver can provide to the race team, to the SimCraft owners to continue to develop and, and improve the technology, I think stands by itself. Uh, one of the things that I would say is when you look at the inherent costs, the cost of purchasing a simulator uh, versus the cost of, of, of training on a track are, are, don't even compare. The nice thing about this system is its adaptability. So I use the analogy of the cars. Um, you know, for, the, for our kids, we're creating a, a stable single environment so that we're working through that process for them to learn and create the mental and the muscle memory. When you've got drivers that drive different cars on different tracks, the ability to customize that rehearses that memory and that response and will shorten the response. When, when you have a technology that they're not coordinated, your brain is still going to be trying to spend some time adapting to that response to say, okay, what is it that I'm supposed to be seeing and how am I supposed to be responding to that? You know, there's a lot of things that we, we do outside of racing where if your car goes off, you start lifting. And if you go off uh, lifting, when your car goes off, you may do a tailspin into the other wall rather than keeping the throttle down and steering with it, uh, which isn't your normal response. But you want the car to do what you're expecting it to do. The more similar it is to the car that you're driving on the racetrack, the more similar your response is going to be and the quicker you're going to get to the right response. So you're going to habituate to a response. So if the response you're developing from the driving simulator, from the tools that you're using are not consistent with the application of the car, you're going to have a disconnect, which doesn't make good sense. And I, you know, I see that at home with my own kids where they'll get onto a steering wheel and a driving game and the response time is not accurate. And for me trying to drive those cars, uh, it's very difficult, whereas my kids can blow through it. However, their response time in another situation is different because they're, they're used to having a lag. They're used to seeing different things from those toys than you see in either a real car or a real 
simulation. One of the things that we know is that your executive functions, which uh, control memory, response to stimuli, um, various things such as that, we know that the way to train that or to ramp it up is to create uh, an environment which you're getting a stimulus, it's a consistent stimulus. The stimulus can be more closely tied to a real world situation and then have it where you have to focus and then you have to multitask. Looking at driving simulators and racing, that certainly is the case all the time. In looking at this particular device, because everything is fixed and it is attached, so you've got the windscreen or the, the um, TV screens which are connected to the seat which is connected to the pedal it's all moving as a unit which more closely represents real life scenarios so not only are we going to uh, improve their executive functions through the process we're also creating an enhanced environment when they return to driving or start driving as young adults